Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the first event of our Progress of Ideas webinar series. I'm Josie Foss. I'm the Executive Director of the Robert Schockenbach Foundation. This series features the work of university faculty whose efforts RSF has supported, and it offers a unique opportunity to learn directly from the experts about the original research they've conducted. Tonight, we're very excited to welcome Professor Michael Gutentag. Michael's a professor of law at LMU Loyola Law School, where he focuses on the intersection of markets and the law. He's specifically interested in how our legal system can be used to facilitate the equitable distribution of resources, a topic that's very near and dear to RSF's heart and our mission. Prior to coming to academia, Professor Gutentag was an executive in the public and private sectors, holding positions that spanned a number of fields, including the internet, entertainment, and financial services. Tonight, he'll share with us the results of his recent work on law, surplus, market regulation, and inequality. Professor Gutentag, thank you so much for joining us. We're all really excited to hear about this incredibly important work. Hi, I'm Mike Gutentag, a professor at law uh, at LMU's Loyola Law School. Welcome. I'm so uh, honored and grateful for this opportunity. Um, especially grateful to the Schlackenbach Foundation for providing funds for my research. I actually think it's really appropriate because I see my research as really being consonant with the work of Henry George, as I hope will become clear over the next half hour. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll take that time to, to introduce you to my ideas. I thought that the most useful approach today would be rather than to dive into one particular topic that I'm focused on, to give you an overview of the landscape of the kinds of questions I've been asking over the last five years. So I wanna provide with this slide a little bit more detail about the roadmap of what I'm gonna to cover today. First, I'm just gonna talk about the overall theme of my research in this area, which is talking about not just progress and poverty, but progress and poverty in the context of surplus. And then I'm gonna narrow down the talk to talk about surplus in one particular context in market transactions. That's why I bring in supply and demand, that's section two. Section three is gonna talk about the opportunities that surplus create the opportunities that law can tap into to provide resources to those who are less well off. Section four looks more on the downside of surplus. Surplus can attract wasteful competition. In many cases, the best way to deal with a surplus is to cooperate rather than compete. And then finally, I'll talk about next steps in my research. The project of my research starts with a very enduring and longstanding question. It's a question Henry George focused his attention on. And it's even more, more important today. Uh, the question is, how can we have so much wealth? So much in Henry George's terminology, so much progress, and yet see such obvious need for those you know, who live in Los Angeles, we have a problem with the unhoused. And just throughout the world, there's obviously uh, incredible poverty, wealth and poverty. And so I think that's a, a question I spent a lot of time struggling with, and that's grounded my research. And to that question, I bring a potential solution, an idea that I've tried to explore um, which is the idea of surplus. What do I mean by surplus? Well, the most intuitive sense of surplus is just extra. Don't we have some extra stuff that we can give to those in need? Um, I guess the economist definition of surplus would be uh, saying that's a value in excess of cost, but I will talk about that in more detail. So this idea of progress and poverty and maybe surplus as a way to address the needs. And I actually think that's a lot of what interested Henry George as well. So where does this idea, it's not a new idea, 
where is the like boldest and clearest statement of this idea? I think it really starts with the work of David Ricardo. David Ricardo did not, was an economist about who wrote about 200 years ago. He did not use the term surplus. He used the term rent. And he identified a specific economic phenomena associated with land ownership. He observed someone owns a piece of land near a city, let's say for farming, it's very rich. They receive $100 in rent. The city expands. The land that, uh, that we want to use that becomes useful expands. People are now willing to spend $100 to rent far off land. How much, what happens to the value of this wonderfully uh, fecund land close to the city? Well, the value of that land increases. Where did that increase come from, Ricardo asked. It's sort of free money, found money. And Ricardo even goes so far as to say, well, why do we have to give that additional money, that rent in Ricardo's terminology to the landowner? Why don't we give it to the people who are working the land? And let me share with you a, a quote from Ricardo's treat, treatise. Ricardo writes in his treatise, The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, published in 1817, as I said, a little over 200 years ago, we could enable farmers to live like gentlemen, gentlemen by taking this rent, this surplus, and just providing it to someone else. And that's the germ of the idea that I've been exploring in my scholarship for the last five years. What is this rent, this surplus? Is it really a tool by which we can meet the needs of those who are less well off without making other people worse off? That's the beauty of the idea of surplus. And I've actually, I call my body of scholarship law and surplus scholarship, because the questions I'm asking have to do with what role does the law play in tapping into these surplus resources in ways that can potentially make everybody better off. So this, just to return to the roadmap slide, this is the part of the talk where I'll talk about surplus in the context of supply and demand. I want to focus the topic today on surplus that arises specifically in market transactions. So this is relatively well, a relatively well studied area um, where surplus arises, but I think the opportunities and risks of surplus in this context have been woefully ignored certainly by legal scholars. And I think there's a lot of valuable research that we can do and a lot of opportunities that we can expose and uncover uh, by doing more work on this area. So what does this look like? Let me be very specific and concrete. And I hope you don't have uh, traumatic recollections of introductory economics because the source of surplus I'm gonna talk about now is or should be very familiar to those who have done the most basic of economics. So let me pull up the tried and true supply and demand curve to talk about surplus in market transaction. So this is perhaps, I hope, a familiar graph of supply and demand. This is the beautiful engine of the market economy. And maybe let me just, for those who haven't looked at these curves in a while, let me just remind you of what they mean and how modern day economists tend to think about them. Um, there's the price axis going up and down and the quantity axis going left to right. So I think it's helpful to think about the price axis. So, Let's imagine we start at a very high price. What happens at a very high price? Is there a lot of demand for a good or service at a very high price? No. People, not everybody is rich and can afford to pay a lot 
for a particular good or service? Are there a lot of people willing to supply the good at a high price or high price? Yes. So at the, at the high price point, we're at a point where supply is in excess of demand. As we move down the price curve, as we go to lower prices, two things happen. As price, as the good gets cheaper, more people want to buy it. That's the downward sloping demand curve. At the same time, as the price goes down, fewer people are willing to supply it. And what do we hit? We hit the magic equilibrium price where the economy functions beautifully. Marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Adam Smith's invisible hand leads to an efficient allocation of resources. That's the story. And that's what you learn in introductory economics. What strikes me is when you look at the picture that way, you're ignoring a huge part of what's going on in that graph. Let me just go one slide forward. What about that huge triangle? All that surplus embedded in the simplest description of a market is a phenomenal amount of surplus. There's a huge area there where people are willing to pay much more than it costs to provide the good. That looks to me like extra. And that to me seems really exciting and promising when we start thinking about the fundamental problem of progress and poverty. So what does a traditional microeconomics analysis say? Well, uh, I think in intro economics, they just give you labels. They say the top half above the price is consumer surplus. The bottom half below the equilibrium price is producer surplus. If you go on to a microeconomics class, they'll teach you about price discrimination, which says, well, gosh, maybe the person selling can find a way to capture some of that consumer surplus. In simple terms, someone's willing to pay a whole lot. Why don't we charge them a whole lot? And what do the microeconomists think of that? They think that's kind of a good idea. Why? Because for the microeconomist, and I am simplifying, um, the worst thing is monopoly pricing. Because when you have monopoly pricing, when you limit supply, you move away from that beautiful equilibrium price. And so from the traditional perspective, I'd rather have the marginal transactions taking place at that price. And if someone has market power, Rather than have them constrain supply, I'd rather have them use that market power to extract surplus from consumers because the world is not worse off. Surplus is of secondary importance in the traditional economic analysis. So that's where, that's where we sort of leave the story of the traditional economic analysis. I think there's a lot more to be said about that huge area of surplus. And that's what I've been researching, and in particular, how the law interacts with this particular area of surplus. And as always, I'm certainly not the first one to say this. I like going to the source of a lot of these insights, and that is, again, David Ricardo. So let me switch back and share the screen. What does David Ricardo say about this situation? He says, there's something odd that happens in that middle space of surplus. And he explains the laws which regulate the progress of rent, or in my terminology, surplus, are widely different from those which regulate the progress of profits. And I think he was right. Let me start explaining. it. So what is going on? What is special about that area of surplus? I think there are two things that are special about that area of surplus. Returning briefly to the roadmap slide, this is the point in the talk where I'm going to talk about the opportunities presented by the ubiquity of surplus and how law can engage with those opportunities. One, it creates an incredible opportunity. 
back to the start of my talk, the opportunity would appear to exist to take care of those who are less well off. That was the opportunity that Ricardo identified when he talked about the possibility of moving the wealth from the landowners to the farmers. Um, but how would we do that? What does that actually look like? How do we create a system that transfers that surplus in ways that we find socially desirable? Well, I've tried to work through some concrete examples of that. So let me talk about that. Some of the examples that I've already discussed and others, I should mention uh, uh, fellow colleague in this area of research is Ramsey Woodcock, uh, who's spent more time focusing on this particular issue, which is that idea of price discrimination. Remember, I just said that for the traditional microeconomist, price discrimination is a good thing to the extent that it avoids monopoly pricing. But what if the people who are willing to pay a lot are poor, do we want to allow firms to transfer that surplus from those who are less well off to those who are better off? And by the way, firms have gotten very sophisticated over the last 20 years of figuring out what people are willing to pay and targeting their pricing based on what people are willing to be willing to pay. So one area of law that we might consider is how to change the rules around price discrimination. Now, I should say that there's a more familiar set of tools that traditional economists and legal scholars do talk about that I sort of I spend less time focusing on because I feel like they've been covered more broadly, which is you can imagine restricting price and using the law to do what the monopolist might want to do. The benefit could be that in some cases, the result of restricting price is that you'll be shifting that surplus between buyer and seller. So these are traditional methods that have generated vast amount of scholarship. So some efforts have been made to raise prices, minimum wages, and essentially that the goal of a minimum wage law is to shift surplus to workers. Similarly, rent control, lowering prices. The goal of a rent control law is to shift surplus from landlords to renters. Now that's kind of a blunt instrument, price regulation, and that's not something that I have focused my research on. I, I don't mean to minimize those as important topics, but I think there's, opportunities elsewhere, such as the idea of looking at price discrimination and targeting price discrimination law. Another area where we can target surplus allocation specifically, I believe, is in the silly boilerplate provisions in consumer contracts. You know how consumer contracts are filled with boilerplate? And guess what? The boilerplate usually works to the advantage of the seller. Well, imagine if all that boilerplate is doing is transferring surplus, inframarginal funds from buyers to sellers. Do we have an attitude toward that? Yeah, we should. We should say no to those kinds of transfers. Surplus tra transfers that tend to be from the poor to the rich are socially undesirable. And we should just prevent them and block them. Consumer boilerplate should be legally prohibited. I've written an article about this uh, that will be forthcoming in a collection of essays in Cambridge University Press next year. Now, I'm gonna step aside. So I've been talking about law and surplus and in market transactions, how the law can play a role in shifting surplus from those who are better off to those who are worse off. Those who are familiar with legal scholarship will raise their hands and say, 
Mike, you're wrong. That can't be right. And those who are less familiar with law and economics legal scholarship will not know what the discussion is about. But let me take a moment. Let me take two minutes to talk about a little bit of a side topic, which I have an article forthcoming in the BU Law Review uh, this spring about, which is, let me explain the side topic. There is a school of thought among legal academics that changing legal rules to redistribute wealth is not a good idea. The people who make this argument are not arguing against redistribution. Their argument is the tax system is always superior to using laws. Laws are a very imperfect way to redistribute wealth. You know, you may be actually be helping some people who are better off. The tax system is nicely targeted to address redistribution, and it's always preferable. Uh, Lewis Kaplan and Steve Chevelle at Harvard Law School are associated with this argument which goes under the name or it's known as a double distortion argument. Well, what I show is, guess where that fails? Where Ricardo thought it would fail. When we're talking about surplus, when we're talking about using laws to divvy up surplus, that presumption in favor of the tax system does not apply. So just a little side note for those who wonder if I've thought about the double distortion paradigm. Yes, I have. I've written an article about it. I've tried to explain why that particular paradigm does not apply if the legal topic is how to divvy up a surplus, which is the legal topic I am fascinated by. So, so that's to what I've talked about so far is this incredible opportunity that Ricardo identified, that I think Henry George had a sense for, and that I think has been underexplored. And I think there's opportunities, I've already mentioned a few, price discrimination, boilerplate law, where we can design the law to move surplus in ways that are socially desirable. Returning one more time just to the roadmap, this is the point in the talk where I wanna focus on the downside of surplus, the possibility of wasteful competition. The other big insight about surplus, about law and surplus is the cost, the peril. Surplus can be economically and socially problematic. Surplus is not necessarily a good thing. Well, let me give you an example about what I'm talking about. Imagine that there's $100 of surplus, let's say $100 of gold sitting there or cryptocurrency sitting there. And I can spend $95 to capture that surplus for myself. Okay. Um, well, let's imagine someone can pay $40, but I can do better and pay $45. Okay, so we spend $95, there's $5 left, or I guess I only spent $45, so I got a great deal. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is I had a private incentive to spend money to capture the surplus, but is the world better off? I expended resources to put the surplus in my pile, but it didn't change how much the surplus was. From a social welfare perspective, that $95 was really wasted. If there was a better way, maybe rather than compete with each other, we could all just agree there's $100, let's just divide it, $10 each. Isn't that a better solution? What's the difference? The difference is we cooperated, we didn't fight, we didn't compete, and we were able to share the resources. If we rely on competition and the prize is a surplus, what's gonna happen? We're likely to waste resources from a social welfare perspective. 
again, this is where the laws of surplus are different than the ordinary law of economics. Usually, go back to Adam Smith. How do we deal with economic problems? Competition, pursuit of self-interest is the it leads to the greatest social welfare. In the context of competition and surplus, the opposite is true. Competition is a recipe for waste. So this is the second area, the second way that law can really engage with the surplus problem, I call it. So this is less optimistic, except that there's a deep truth that comes out of this, which is not all market situations are solved well by pursuing self-interest. So where do we see this problem and how do we address it? Well, one place we see this problem is, again, in price discrimination. Because when firms are using price discrimination to try and capture surplus, what are the social welfare gains? None. They're trying to, I like the analogy of cutting in line. They're trying to take something from someone else. They're spending money. And what do the other people do? They're gonna try and defend their resources. But what's been gained by that expenditure? If there's a more efficient, more cooperative way to share those resources, better that we do that and avoid the expenditures. So again, another argument against allowing price discrimination, something that is generally favored by my most microeconomics. I've written on a particularly extreme example of this problem, which is insider trading. My claim is that most of the time when I trade on inside information, I'm not making the world a better place. What am I doing? I'm getting the profits instead of you. So money, similar idea, money spent to gather inside information or to use insider trading for my advantage is not making the world a better place. It's wasted resources. And that is why we should outlaw insider trading. We don't want people racing to cut in line in front of each other for no good social purpose. Uh, it's kind of a novel idea. I have an article just out on that. I told you I was gonna provide a synopsis of my scholarship. Uh, in the Brooklyn Law Review that just came out a couple of months ago. Returning one more time to the roadmap, this is the point in the discussion where I'm just going to review briefly some next steps in research. There's a lot more to do. This is a rich area of scholarship that I alone am not going to be able to tackle, and uh, I just hope to continue to make progress. So let me talk about some of the open issues. The first is, I use the term surplus broadly. What precisely does it mean? It's quite a complicated idea. It's easier to show surplus that's created in market transactions simply because one person's willing to pay a lot more than someone else is willing to sell for. That's an obvious surplus. But surplus is embedded throughout our economy. And I think the, one of the important next steps in my research, or for those who want to can do this kind of research, is really identifying and specifying what components of transactions involve surplus or what components of our economic wealth involve surplus. A second area of research has to do with more exploration of how laws interact with this phenomenon. For instance, I think price gouging laws. Traditional economic analysis says laws that prohibit price gouging make no sense because they take away from the beauty of supply equals demand. But what effect do price gouging laws have on the allocation of surplus? And how do we weave that in to our understanding of the welfare effects of laws. And then finally, 
legal scholarship has been fixated on this question of efficiency and the equilibrium price. I hope that this body of research will expand that focus because I am essentially not arguing for a new methodology. I'm using very traditional tools of a law and economic scholar. My arguments do not call for a new kind of social welfare analysis, not to judge that, but I just wanna point out, I'm working within a fairly traditional and familiar domain. And I think what I'm hoping to do, or what I hope to do is to bring along other people who work within that domain and say, oh my gosh, we have been missing something, something that David Ricardo and Henry George saw, that when there's this enduring problem of so much and so little, and there seems to be extra, that's not an illusion. That is a reality. There's an opportunity to bring our thinking together and our society together, perhaps working more through cooperative methods than competitive method, methods to achieve a better place. Anyway, I've already talked, I think probably too long. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And I really look forward to any questions or comments either here now or in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, for providing support for my work. Okay, well, thank you so much, Michael, for that wonderful presentation. Um, we're gonna go ahead and open the floor up for questions. Um, I'm guessing that people have a lot um, on their minds having heard that presentation. And before we do that, I just wanna say that um, we're so excited to have been able to support this work um, and think that there's a lot of really important things that, that you're looking at. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and read the first question. Um, it's from Ed Dodson, and it says, and it's long, so bear with me. Um, is it not the case that private property in nature, absent the Georgia's call for the public capture of rents, i.e. your surplus, results in an initial redistribution of wealth from its producers to non-producing rentier interests and others who enjoy subsidies and privileges under the law? If you look in the chat, you should be able to see that if you I need better, to. I better look in the chat. And Josie, I'm hearing a little static. I don't know if there's anything you can do about that, but let me look in the chat to, um, let me see. Okay, so in the chat. Sorry, it's in the Q&A, apologies. No worries, Q&A. I think the, the bulk of it is the, the sort of second and or excuse me, second, third, and fourth lines. So, uh, sure, friends, and then the initial yeah, You know, I, I, I am not a, enough of a Henry George scholar to know if, if the extent to which what I'm saying is or isn't consistent with what Henry George said. I wish I could get um, Edward on into the Zoom as well. Let me try and see if I can parse this a little bit better. From its producers. Huh. So I think the question is, how does the initial allocation of land work if we don't have redistribution. Um, I guess I don't have, I, I wish, and I, if you wanna post a follow-up question, I'll be happy to try on that. I don't have a, um, an obvious answer about where I think these surpluses end up, except to share your intuition that often allowing for the private capture um, will take away our ability our ability as a society to dictate um, who benefits from the surplus um, and, and also may potentially waste resources. I don't I, I apologize I don't really fully understand the question so I think that's the best I'll do for now. 
Um, okay, why don't I why don't I go on and we'll circle back if you can. Okay. Uh, All right. So the the next question, and I hope my audio is better. I was getting some notices that I had a lot of static, so apologies. Much better for me. Um, okay. So the next one uh, says, for those of us who are interested in this area but want to start with something easier to digest than a two hundred year old philosophers and law review articles, what are some suggestions of where to start? Wow. Um, you should read my forthcoming book, which really uh, tries to present these arguments in a much more user-friendly um, way that uh, brings together these ideas in simple, powerful uh, ways that make clear what the claims are. And they're not, not even as painful as a half an hour of me talking about law and economics. Unfortunately, I haven't written that book. And if someone else wants to jump ahead of me and write that book, I stand ready. I think that it just shows how much opportunity there is that I really think these are ideas that, and this is why I thank the funding, the Schalkenbach, if I got it right in the pronunciation, I thank them for funding the research. I think these are important new ideas that no one has really fully worked through and fully brought to the current discussion, where at least in my experience, uh, uh, working as an academic, we are to a large degree uh, locked into a more traditional economic mindset. But um, I, I'm glad to hear you don't, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that you, that you wanna learn more. And I, and I think other people like me, that's oh, are the onus is on us to do a better job of communicating these things in simpler ways, because it does challenge fundamental paradigms that, that tend to be relied on like, competition in markets is a good thing. And that there's scarcity is the defining uh, aspect of our society, not surplus. So these are big ideas we need to find a good way to challenge. And I hope, uh, Schalkenbach, I hope working with um, nonprofits will be part of the process of communicating these ideas, clarifying these ideas, making them more policy ready. So I wish I could help right now, but I can't. You have to read okay. those long law review, those painfully long law review articles. Okay. Well, and the forthcoming book, right? <laughs> well, the forthcoming book is more of a dream that my family is, is, is avoiding. I don't know. It's, it's dreading. Uh, it's dreading. Okay. <laughs> it might be a little while in the making. Thank you. Well, think of all the good you can do for the rest of us. Set your I, set your family aside. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were. I wish I could. I wish I could have that big an impact. It's only if we all work together that we're going to communicate these important ideas. Um, okay. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Another question, um, Mike. On several occasions, you use the words efficient and also better. Efficiency might be easier to unpack as Pareto optimality or Rawlsian equilibriums, but what about the term better? How would you like to see it used? Wow. I, I did not see myself. I, I was not aware that I was interspersing those two concepts. Um, these questions are all so sophisticated. I feel like we should be in a seminar where I could push back and ask you, for again, for more clarifications. Um, the framework for what I talked about today is the, the normative framework to be a legal scholar is really the idea of a social welfare function. So when I'm talking about better or efficiency, I am generally talking about uh, at the at some levels, just not wasting resources, and then I guess the next step I would would make in terms of the normative framework that I accept is that we can all agree as a community that as a general matter, a ten dollars is more valuable to someone who's less well off. So that um, you know that redistribution from those who have a lot to those who have a little is a net welfare gain. So that's, I apologize if I was not, not as precise as I could be. Okay. Whew. I, I okay. hope that's it on the questions. Are there more? This is, uh, this is what, it's <laughs> there, half there are more, there okay. are more. No, the, the, the folks who, who show up for this 
type of thing and who work with RSF tend to have pretty sharp questions. Um, so here's another one if you're up for it. Um, I love it. <laughs> your discussion share. of the waste of competition to get a bigger, wait, excuse, let me start over. Your discussion of the waste of competition to get a bigger share of the surplus sounded like the rent seeking literature in the public choice field. Are you unfamiliar with that literature or were you avoiding the terms that the audience may not recognize? Okay, I love this question. Um, so there's a bunch of literature about wasteful competition and it's written for this, for the general, the, the others who may not know it, it's written by the most conservative economists out there. They are keenly starting maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, Gordon Tullock um, and other folks they're keenly aware of the possibility that competition can waste resources. Gordon Tullock says, um, it's a well-known fact that competition is not always a good thing. So here we have the people who are cons more conservative than I am saying, yes, competition can waste resources. But then they make this like, in my mind, completely, uh, Oh, what's the right word? Politically motivated. I don't think they're even aware of the move they make. What they say is, well, this wastefulness of competition only appears in one domain. And they go from this big idea, competition can waste resources. If what you're doing is competing for rent, and they use the term rent seeking, they go from that big idea to say, this is only a problem in one situation. And guess what that one situation is that these conservatives point out? Government regulation. So this big idea that I, I agree with them on that, that, um, that competition, you know, if you're just fighting over a fixed pie, competition's usually not the best way to go about things. The big idea gets focused on as an art and treated exclusively as an argument against government regulation. And you may ask, or I would ask, I've actually, I don't have it. I don't wanna, there's, okay, I will do this because it's right here. There's, uh, I don't know if you can see it. I can't see the camera now, but anyway, there, I wrote an article in the Utah Law Review, Law and Surplus Opportunities Missed, in which I dedicate about five pages to their rent seeking argument, rent seeking argument. And I ask what seems to me the most logical question, which is, gee, if competition wastes resources in the provision of government services, why doesn't it waste resources in markets? Why isn't this surplus competition a much bigger problem? And if you go and read their analysis as to why it's not a much bigger problem than they originally suggest, it's amazing. There is no logic or thought behind it. Basically what they do is they say, Adam Smith told us competition is good in markets. So it must be true that competition can't be bad in markets. They basically wave their hands. There's one, there's a, a, an article, I think Gordon wrote it about what's the difference between rent seeking and profit seeking. And basically what he says is if you're in a market seeking profit, then that's all great. It's only a problem in the context of government provision. So no, I didn't, um, I didn't, I, I don't know why I didn't mention it today, but it's certainly, I think it's one of the fun intellectual history things that a central part of my claim that we need to focus more on how competition for surplus waste resources and move away from competitive solutions to a lot of social problems for that reason was actually brought to bear and sort of championed by this incredibly conservative group of economists and law and economic scholars. And then they just decided to put blinders on and decide it would only be a problem when it comes to government regulation. Anyway, long answer, love the question. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it more. And as I say, I've written about five pages uh, or five or 10 pages in that Utah article about this incredible blinding they've done and 
you know, one can one can speculate about why they made that choice. OK, sorry. Yes, one can certainly speculate. Um, <laughs> another question. Can you give an example of how boilerplate transfers transfer surplus to the wealthy? Yeah. So the question was boilerplate transfer surplus to the wealthy. Mm -hmm. So no one reads boilerplate. We all know that. And um, a couple of uh, legal scholars, I, I want to say Florencia at NYU Law School, but I'm going to mess up her last name. They looked and it's very easy to go through the boilerplate and see who wins. So let's say the boilerplate covers something like um, whether certain types of damages to your product will be covered by a warranty if you've used the product in an unusual way, okay? <laughs> so the boilerplate will say that the consumer does not get that protection. So anyway, Florencia did a study Every boy, almost every boilerplate provision works to the benefit of the seller. It's like if there's any, and there's no way you're going to go and negotiate or get that money back. So every time you buy something, you are effectively taking a bunch of, albeit small risks, but small risks. Because if you have to rely on the boilerplate, you will lose. I know this. I went, I, I had a trip that got changed. And I was like, oh, great, because it said on the website, I'd get my money back. And of course, idiot me as a law school professor, I pulled up the 50 pages of boilerplate and deep in there was an explanation about, well, but if this happens, you won't get your money back. Now, so, so, so boilerplate works against buyers and for sellers. And then the question is just who on average has more money, the consumers in the world or the sellers in the world. And the sellers in the world tend to be businesses owned by wealthy folks you know what percent of the capital of the stock market is owned by the top 10 percent a lot you know mm -hmm. so so it's just that it's that it's that small transfer that small sucking of value from consumers to sellers makes a lot of sense so very important question how do you feel about extended warranties <laughs> <laughs> sorry oh whether you should buy them <laughs> i never buy if that's what if that's what you mean i never buy them i think i mean i to me that's the so the the the, the field starts to so my claim is a pure transfer claim i don't know for those who know the field there's a lot of research on behavioral economics based in behavioral economics which shows that people systematically make um bad decisions and so you know, if you scare people into thinking their product's going to break, you can charge or have them focus on them, that possibility you can charge them more money. So I think that's a different kind of transfer. That's sort of a beat. What um, Warren Fargill, I was just looking to see if I have a book out of his back there, um, talks about um, behavioral exploitation, you know, exploiting consumer, predictable consumer behavior biases. That makes sense. All right. I'm going to report that back to my husband because he and I, <laughs> every time we buy something, we go round and round and I am very anti-extended warranty. Don't you think, Josie? Right? <laughs> it's a scam. That's my thought. But, you know, my husband's also an economist, so I sort of trust oh him on gosh, some really? stuff. Has he read? What? <laughs> you, know. you don't want to see the back of my head. That was unfair. Well, okay, so I'm going to, you can throw Orrin Barr Gills. He's a professor at Harvard. Okay. He's, he's so I'm going to go to the next question. Um, right. Professor, your discussion of insider trading and surplus reminds me of Robert Bork's contribution to co competition theory, i.e. if market capture by a firm benefits consumers, then it should not be regulated. Excuse me if I, if my paraphrase is inaccurate, it says in the question, how does your argument of regulation versus taxation respond to Bork? Wow. Um, I don't, you know, I'm trying to even reconstruct the, um, the Bork argument in my head. It's going to take me a minute because so he, one thing I would say is if I, if I remember correctly, he uses the, the term surplus, but he's not referring to surplus. 
It's a complete misnomer in his scholarship. So, and again, I feel like I have the Bork book behind me too. I must like I have a huge library, and but I can't cheat and look. So his his use, one thing I would say about Bork is his use of the term surplus is very uh, misleading. So that that's just sort of a little tidbit. Um, let's see, antitrust. I mean, wow. So I think the, the sort of the meat of the, or the, the theory of yes, the, where please. the question is coming from is around if, if market capture by a firm benefits consumers, then it shouldn't be regulated. And so I guess the, the question is, how do you respond or how does your scholarship relate to that notion if it does? If it market capture... Well, I, I say it sounds like I just say the absolute opposite. I mean, I, it seems to me like what I'm saying is if all someone is doing is expending resources to capture surplus, that's a social waste and we should absolutely regulate it. I'm not I have to be honest, I'm not once again, I'm not making the connection to uh, Bork's arguments. So but yeah, I think so. I, 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 I guess I am more pro-regulation than mm -hmm. a lot of my uh, fellow colleagues because they ignore the surplus problem. You know, they basically say all comp and, and the insider trading debate, I don't know if you all are following it. I mean, there's legislation that was at the House, it's moving to the Senate, and it's really horrible legislation. Uh, because it's basically based on the Bork, the 1950s insider trading economic analysis, actually Henry Manny in particular, which ignores the problem of surplus and wasteful mm -hmm. competition for surplus. Anyway, just go, go speak to your congressman. Don't let them pass that crappy legislation. It's not too late. Okay. Um, so the, the person who asked that initial question has yes. clarified it. So I'm going to read the clarification. Ed? So it says, my comment relates to the common usage of the term redistribution as a method of shifting resources from haves to have nots, whereas redistribution is the historical process of shifting resources from producer haves who then become have nots. So I, I guess we, do you want me to reread the, the question in like with that clarification? Uh, let me see if I can read it. It's right at the top of the Q and A. Yeah, it was the I first one entered. From have words. Historical. I'm not. Yeah, I'm still. I'm so sorry, Ed. I'm still struggling. The one thing I would say is here's here. I don't know if this is at all going to be responsive, um, but the pe people who write in redistribution. I mean, I, I have a negative reaction even to the term because it assumes uh, an initial ownership. And I really, you know, that you're taking something from someone else. And um, huh. when, we, when we look at surplus, then we're really allocating. I, I don't have a good answer. Let me look one more time. Can I do we have time, yeah, Josie? Sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Let me just see. It's a method of from the haves to the have-nots. Okay, I understand that. When we say redistribution, we're taking from the haves to the have-nots. That's the claim. In the historical process of shifting, is the historical process of shifting resources from producer haves who then become have-nots from producer has. And he wrote, Ed wrote at the bottom, initial redistribution is actually theft. I think that's a further clarification. Initial redistribution? Yeah, is actually theft. It's well, this is, the, this is the core issue. What is theft? What is property, right? I mean, this is, it, it goes back to John Locke. Um, for, John Locke said, right, that you can put your labor in and by putting your labor into something, you own it. That's the basis for the initial property allocation. And then at any point after that, someone who would take that would be a thief, right? The problem is the John Locke story really doesn't work because it's among the caveats is John Locke is 
that it's you have to leave as much and as good for everybody else. So, you know, I think, I, Ed, I think you and I are, are talking about really one of the core issues. I mean, I hate, to, I hate to say it, but it really is property. What counts as private property? At what point does someone get the right to own and control something? Going back to, you know, Robert Nozick's famous arguments about anarchy, state, and utopia, that once something becomes private property, there's no, you, you deny their freedom if you take that property from them. And I think the counter argument is property is a legally socially constructed idea. And so maybe better to think about people borrowing things from the polity, from social society, and then asking that they be returned. And now if that's the definition of property, just to play out the two extremes, right? One extreme is, Property is what I first capture and then any taking of it, it violates my freedom. The other extreme is there is property, we all, there's a lot of stuff in the world and um, we get to borrow it and use it to the extent the law pr permits and get returns in ways that are socially designed to, to further society. But anything beyond that, is uh, taking away the freedom of everyone else to share in the resources. I, I, you know, this is an issue I've been thinking a lot about and my thoughts are very premature. I hope I've engaged with your question. <laughs> okay, next question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Let's get back to extended <laughs> warranties. <laughs> that was a softball for me. Uh, <laughs> what sorts of laws can enable more efficient capital surplus distribution besides tax, re tax regulations without undermining capitalistic principle? Are these laws and furthering capitalism mutually exclusive? Well, so I guess the question is, what's the example of my agenda working um, and that's really another, you know, that's, I need to write more and more law review articles. Um, the point I'm making is if you look at the arguments for letting markets work, they ignore this problem of wasteful competition. So it's not necessarily true that on the one hand, we have capitalism, and on the other hand, we have regulation. It's not, it's not true that, um, unfettered competition, even in markets, is a good thing. And that creates a lot of space. So I guess, so just laws that may work. I mean, this goes back, I skimmed over it, but minimum wage law is obviously a big one, right? I mean, and it, it's far from obvious when you start thinking about wasteful competition and social welfare functions. In fact, I would think if you look at traditional economics literature, it's starting to move more quickly than legal scholarship to seize on these opportunities where regulation and efficiency um, cooperation is more efficient than competition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I give myself a four on that answer. My answer to Ed, I give myself a seven. So I don't know. I, <laughs> I'm going downhill. Let's how many more questions? Okay, okay. last last question because okay. we're coming up on the hour. Okay, um, extended with, warranties. No, <laughs> no, we're leaving the warranties behind. <laughs> okay. um, with the rash of COVID nineteen vaccines coming out, uh, there's considerable debate about patents. Do you support patents, and if so, when? Yeah, another great question. Yeah, patents is um, I I. I definitely support patent. Patents is another example. Um, it's really a microcosm of this question of when and how do we treat surplus that's embedded in the modern economy, right? Because the people and the resources that have come together to create the huge body of knowledge, which is freely available to those who then create an create a vaccine and get a patent. I mean, they're building on a phenomenal wealth of free resources. So yeah, I support patents to the extent they're efficient, but I just think we have to uh, keep in mind, as I guess Elizabeth Warren said, you know, 
just like no one made a successful business on their own, no one like came up with a patentable idea on their own. That it's really bringing together con resources contributed, surplus resources contributed from throughout society. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what about patenting stretches of the human genome, for example? <laughs> Uh, that's outside of my pay grade, but um, <laughs> I know I, I'm going to I'm going to pass on that. But uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. Well, Michael, thank you so much for this great presentation. And it is such a blessing to feel like my my work is valued and supported. So um, absolutely. Absolutely. And I hope this is just the beginning. I do as well. And it's wonderful to see you, you know, integrating Henry George, who was obviously the person who inspired our organization to be founded, um, weaving his ideas in with what you're working on in 2022. That's um, very gratifying for us. Um, and thank you so much for being part of this event. And thank you for everybody uh, for attending. And I hope you all have a wonderful night.